Welcome back to our podcast, No More Secrets. As always, I'm your niece, Katie Albrecht. And I'm your Aunt Mary Albrecht. And we are so happy today to have a guest. His name is Jeff. Say hello, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> I had a feeling he was going to do that right when I said that. I did that. too. I've only met you a couple of times, but I'm like, yeah, he's going to say that. Corny, yeah. Dad, <laughs> dad jokes. And I'm not even a dad yet. <laughs> dad jokes. But Mary we, says those too. It's we okay. had a little discussion. This is Jeff Chapman. And I was talking about how the term chap means guy in, like, they use that in, in British, in British mm-hmm. um, vernacular, <laughs> like, oh, I'm a real lucky chap, and it usually means guy. And then Jeff Chapman said, he, you realize that as a, as a kid, that you had a redundant last name, mm-hmm. guy man. Yeah. I mean, this, just this guy man. <laughs> British guy man. British guy man, yeah. yeah. And yeah, actually the Chapman is English, and so it, oh, is it came from my English grandfather on my dad's side. Well, he was actually part French, too. Man, it's confusing, but mostly Scottish, German, Scottish, German, English, French in that order. Whoa. Hmm. So, say that ten times. And I'm proud to be part of part a of diverse, it's a like diverse our... eclectic I don't know it's, it's like our eclectic, ecosystem. Yeah. yeah, it is. I, I mean, that's, I think, one of the things <laughs> that really yeah, <laughs> makes me appreciate diversity is that I am diverse, That you are too, diverse. And I like to cultivate, cultivate diversity as well. And let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, I met Jeff through his mom, who is a client of mine, but now Jeff has become a very good friend and is also kind of a client in that he, you've partaken in Sherry's services and, and mm-hmm. come here for wicker time and all of that. And I, we started to bond on some issues with, um, well, certainly with mental health, but also with um, how that is related to the health of the planet and the um, climate change and things like that. And Jeff is a local farmer. And he has been doing that for almost eleven years. Or eleven years is that about right? I would say eleven years because I think it's it did start when I was back in Urbana Champaign after I um, finished with but did not graduate college down there. And uh, I started out at a um, place called Tiny Greens, and they did micro sprouts, micro sprouts, and organic uh, vegetables as well. Okay, so yeah, so that actually leads me into my next question because, or my first question was. You know, right now you're a local farmer, but at at first you were planning to go to medical school. Is that correct? Yeah, I went down to U of I, Urbana Champaign, and um, almost got kicked out and had to write him a letter explaining why I flunked Spanish. And I was like, well, basically, Spanish isn't part of the biology curriculum, so if you're going to kick me out for flunking it's, Spanish, then it's a little different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, they, they, they let me in, and uh, mm-hmm. they probably shouldn't have on their account because all I did was use the system to learn what I wanted to instead of learning what they wanted me to and so I just sort of decided on um, initially I had gone in trying to go down the pre-med track and I was integrative and uh, molecular and cellular biology sorry and I switched over to integrative biology because once I realized that the competitive cutthroat nature of the pre-med track was really not what I was after especially in an environment where we're supposed to be encouraging learning and not competing I um, switched over to integrative biology with a focus on plant sciences and horticulture and the horticulture part was spurred by one of my favorite professors that I had during an introductory course, which was Robert Skirvin and at he U of I. Advent, what did he invent? He, um, well, he didn't invent it, but he discovered and then propagated and patented the thornless raspberry, and I believe blackberry, and a couple other uh, thornless brambles that he then taught us of the process to do it. And you can actually do it at home. You just can't patent it at home. Okay. But, um, you grow out a thousand plants, you'll discover one that has a mutant offspur that's growing a branch without thorns and I've discovered this in the multiflora rose that's invasive tangent <laughs> it's okay sorry <laughs> but, we have an agreement yeah. here because he's so hyper brilliant that he tends to maybe go here mm-hmm. and so once in a while we, we're gonna you know redirect <laughs> yeah. yeah just pull it back you because I tend it. to yeah Let channel it. out into other but it's areas, all interesting but. stuff though I feel like you you bring up points that I'm like oh I didn't even think of that or my my brain is not even capable of thinking of so it's kind of here it's interesting to hear about. it's not like you're just rambling about nothing okay good you know? yeah yeah it's a yeah. pseudo ramble but interesting enough to keep attention <laughs> I feel smarter go. listening to you so I feel like that's a good sign I guess oh, well, thank you. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say smart things <laughs> it is mostly just a flow of consciousness where I'm like oh this and that and that relates this way and let me try and 
explain that. And yeah, mm-hmm. just but, but you also said that originally it. you were thinking of medical school because you wanted to change the world. Like you wanted to go down yeah. to Africa or whatever. And yeah, I wanted to go to the, the Amazon people. if rainforest was oh, my the ultimate Amazon. goal. And then wow. also exploring some of the Great Barrier Reef, which has mm, been diminished quite a bit through all the bleaching events and yeah, but you, but when you realized it was competitive and people weren't really in it for the altruistic reasons that you wanted to be in it. Yeah, you, I was becoming a doctor to help people, and I realized that most of the people who were becoming doctors were there to help themselves. And so I decided I'm going to split off and find an area that is going to encourage and nurture that sort of cooperative, collaborative, uh, encompassing, all-encompassing, altruistic sort of um, and I found it in horticulture because everybody in horticulture, they're not competing with each other. They're competing with themselves to grow better plants, discover more things, learn better things. And, and learn better, from each other. Yeah, and learn from each other, too, because you always go to, you ask your grandma or your mom's friend or somebody like gardening tips. They always want to share them. If you ask somebody in the medical field the cutting edge of a new research program. They hold on to it. Yeah, it's proprietary knowledge. They, like, hoard it, yeah. Whoa. And so, yeah, that's that's, that's what I really got into was uh, understanding that the sharing, collaborating is more powerful than any of those other things because you hamper and um, prevent progress when you don't share and collaborate and aren't open. Mm-hmm. And so, so the horticulture really just drove that home. And everybody in the program just had that mentality of openness, sharing, okay. collaboration. and. Which would be nice if we had that all the time, right? It is. It's really <laughs> nice. And I mean, competition certainly has its place, don't get me wrong, but, n- but not I in mean, an educational environment per se, when okay. you're competing to get an education. And there you go. That's what I felt like I was doing, was I was paying cash to, and I didn't get any like uh, scholarships or anything like that. So yeah. I was going into it and being like, well, I'm paying for what I'm being taught, so I want to be, be able to choose what I'm being taught. And I, I basically did after sophomore year okay and then um then i had a medical withdrawal and then i um realized a few things and decided not to finish my degree and i'm actually sort of glad that i didn't because i think it pushed me down the path that i had intended to go down weren't you like one class away from graduating three credit hours yeah oh, three credit hours it was okay. calculus and then I, it was one other gen ed that i didn't get the final hour for or something like that and okay. yeah my parents were so mad <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, especially when you're so close and stuff, but it's, you got to do what you got to do for your own And I explained sake. it to them, too, and after yeah. having my medical withdrawal for depre- a depressive event, mm-hmm. uh, they kind of understood, and they were like, well, okay, yeah, you were kind of learning about yourself and figuring out where you wanted to go in life, and that's kind of what college is for, I and- believe. Mm-hmm. The three credits, it could More be... More than just the educational part of it, yeah. And yes, everybody always says it this. You can always just credits. finish it. Yeah, it could be 30, like meaning if you want it, you, you can go get it. The other credits don't go away. And, and yeah, I've always so. known that too. If I really mm-hmm. wanted to finish it, I could go back and get that diploma and piece of paper that could then propel me into different career zones that I really don't want to go. I'm more interested in staying in, involved in the community and making personal connections. And mm-hmm. so, so speaking of the community, you, you live right here couple miles from the fitness loft Mm -hmm. again a local farmer how did you end up on casey road on 17 acres in libertyville as a farmer well it's (laughs) it's kind of like all those other experiences where you're like how could this ever have happened from what did occur and it was just so serendipitous and i call it that just because i've looked up the definition of serendipitous and to a t it fits it is like a fortuitous circumstance and timing allowed me to be able to introduce myself as the caretaker because the 2008 housing crash decreased the property value so much that my parents were able to put an offer on it at the same time that my ex-girlfriend broke up with me and so they bought the property that then I became instantly the caretaker of within about two weeks and they bought it from their parents though right um well it was in a trust I believe and the other two sisters weren't interested in it and so when my parents put the offer up the two sisters agreed to it, so and so be, that and because became my of the, mother. My mom was the primary property owner after that, and, and they so, could buy out the other sisters yep. because of the property values. Oh, being, it went way down. In yeah, the, yeah, and also the conservation easement we have on the property severely and drastically reduced the property value as well because nobody could, you know, turn you it into develop. a strip mall. You can't develop it. You have to leave it exactly the same, which was completely the intention of why we put the conservation easement on it. It was a sacred property that. We had all grown up on as a family, and as everybody sort of decided that, yeah, we put so much effort into keeping this natural that why would we ever give it up as being natural? Because you can you can do it instantly. And in one day, mm-hmm. you can destroy everything that had 100 years, well, in our case, what, 50, 
50 some years have been working towards to oh. maintain and preserve wow. and so it was really important to us understanding ecology too because we had a, a connection to ecology my great uncle being one of the first people in the u.s to get a degree from it and then wow. lived out by glacier national park and taught at the the university out there which i forgot what it was but um, yeah, he got it so early there were no jobs for ecology, so he had to teach. That's what I, you do. Interesting. You did that. This is a fact that I don't remember you sharing. Oh, you yeah, know. This, it's deep. Because it, yeah, it goes can, deep because your grandmother, too. Yeah, my grandma was, was really into botany and she loved orchids, too, and all the natives. She knew all the scientific names and she would spout them off, and I would be like, what? That's a funny name. But then it's sort of, you know, you get introduced early on and a language becomes something that you can pull right back up, like riding a bike. And when I went to college, I'm like spouting off all these scientific names and they're like where did you learn this stuff and I'm like my grandma <laughs> and they were like she must have been an amazing woman and at that point in my life I was like damn she was <laughs> was she and alive it, when you went it, to coach she I knew she was an amazing woman before she passed away but like after she passed away I started reflecting a lot more and being like wow I really miss having her around being able to talk to her her depth of wisdom and all mm. of the, the lessons that she learned I could reflect off of without having to go through it it was such a value and uh, Ugh, an amazing that's resource you take for granted sometimes when you're a kid because oh, yeah. you don't know anything else you just this is life and you don't think of like how exactly. special it is or yeah. how the connections in it and stuff but mm -hmm. so you had like renters at your place, Yeah, at right? the property. It went through a tumultuous time, too, because after my grandparents passed away in 2004, but before I became the caretaker in, I think it was 2009, um, we did rent it out to some people who were um, associated with Prairie Crossing, which is actually a, a great place that um, my grandparents, I believe, were part of uh, helping develop along with the Rannies and I believe the Moody's, or not, not, not Moody's, Al Moody's, the person who takes care of... Um, the property of the Donnellys. Donnellys, yeah, from and the Donnelly phone books. Yeah, yeah. and so um, they, they developed Prairie Crossing, and I, um, oh yeah, the, the renter, sorry, tangenting all on my own. No, go on. But yeah, they, I didn't even notice. we, we I didn't moved either. into, or we had them move into the property because we wanted to have tenants that were organic farmers. Unfortunately, my aunt was kind of in charge of it at the time and didn't make all the best decisions for managing the renters, and they, they had a lot of freedom and, and what did they could do and one of the worst things that happened out there was that they um, tilled up our septic leach field to plant a tomato hoop house on top of and if anybody knows much about septic leach fields you don't disturb them and you certainly mm. don't till them up is that like leeches leeches no it's the um we have a septic tank and a uh, well and so instead of sewer lines we push all of our waste into a septic tank which is basically a buried tank that then okay. separates out the solids and then pushes the the wastewater into the ground and it should soak down into it and that's the leach field so the leach field mm. is where all of your poop and pee travels off to to soak into the ground if you disturb it it doesn't soak in properly because oh. they did layer it with sand and soil and other plants and stuff like that and so if you till it up you're just turning it up and you're creating um, not an even layer for it to distribute into and so it then has more of a potential to leak or um, push out through the ground in places it's not supposed to instead mm. of seeping down into it. Yeah but, I can see how that's a little bit more than just a leech like the creature that sucks blood or whatever. Yeah <laughs> and I, 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 that's one of those things I don't think about too is like most people wouldn't understand what a leech field is but because I nope. had to you know become intimately familiar with how to take care of the property I learned absolutely everything I could about it and how it functions and that makes sense. Yeah, and even our well is a shallow well, which is actually sort of at risk. I How discovered. many feet? Usually people go down about 100 feet. Ours is only at, um, I think, 69 or 70 feet. Okay, because we, we lived on Casey Road, too, and I think ours was Didn't like you guys live around. at the same time? Yeah. Around? Well. Because if he's been there 11 years, then you were... We would... moved off of Casey Road in 2015. So oh, I would have been there six... for two or three years then. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that yeah. interesting? interesting. Yeah. yeah, that is crazy, small world Yeah, stuff. you guys are neighbors, and you didn't even notice it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, my husband actually went to um, look at your porch or something or your greenhouse or do you oh, have a probably greenhouse? The greenhouse yeah yeah which we've okay. just replaced because it's had problems constantly yeah and he, he gave him a price or whatever and it ne never ended up working out but years later he ends up meeting Bonnie and Dave your parents and they're like we know you you're yeah. a forest carpenter and so it all kind of 
mm-hmm. came together. But um, that's why I like community because even if you don't realize it, you've interacted with people before, and then yeah, it just yeah. comes up again. It feels and, like yeah. a big family kind yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. And I feel yeah. like being a local farmer is great for that because then you get to go to like oh, I love farmers that, yeah. markets. Yeah, and talk like, about the farmers markets I've been around here. Fairly well exposed to the public, and I really enjoy it too because I'll go to the Liberty Hall Farmers Market. That's where we sell. But unfortunately, next year we're not planning on attending it just because we've been having a lot of issues and then the drought this year sort of devastated us and we're just refocusing on what we want to try and do with the property as well which hopefully more educational tours oh i love that yeah we go to the farmer's market and one of the things that really pointed me towards educational tours was that everybody that comes there i try and talk their ear off i'm like oh do you want to hear more do you want to hear about how we grew our vegetables and what we did and what we're trying to do and the how and why. And yeah, what all do you have on that farm? I know you also do, you have a company called Soful Blooms for flowers. Yeah, yeah. you have vegetables as well? Yeah, And we even do. bees? Yeah, my brother could take care, takes care of the bees, and sometimes we'll sell honey at the farmer's market um, for him, but the last winter all of his bees died, and so he had to reset. All of them? Yeah, he lost four four colonies of bees because he was keeping them on the property, and the winter was, it was bad just at the wrong time, and it got cold just at the wrong time, too cold. And they, uh, it like shocked them into. So that doesn't having, normally happen. They don't normally die out throughout the, it, the winter. They should not, but it's been much more frequent that they do die. And it's sort of Ooh. a normal thing now that you, you have most of them die. And if yeah. you're lucky, they'll survive. Oh. And so you'll have to restart in the spring with what's called a nuke or a queen cell, where they mm-hmm. send a queen in a box surrounded by, I think it's about 10,000 workers, which sounds like a lot, but it's, it sits inside of like, like, a half square foot box and or I guess it's like a quarter of a cubic foot that's volume goes but um I think bees are so cool to, I think they are they, so cool and, and we've learned so much about I know they have a bad them. connotation yeah but they they have they do a lot for everyone everything you know like because mm-hmm. of the pollen and everything like I've when I was first learning about climate change and um kind of the effects of it I, I've I learned that the bees are kind of crucial to that like the, them go disappearing and they're a crucial step to it and in fact if you look at all of um because <laughs> it kind of starts everything you know the circle oh, should, of life it's not funny but in asia and parts of china where the pollution and um environmental destruction has been so bad they've lost all of their native pollinators mm. and they also use poisons to the extent that they can't bring in honeybees to pollinate and so they have literally had to be laboriously taking pollen sacks and a paintbrush to hand pollinate and I've, I've heard this about their plum trees i don't know if it's true for a lot of other crops but now that they have to hand pollinate they're understanding that the difference between the services provided by the insects and doing it by hand has a vast economic imprint and, and cost to it and it, mm. it's just some a service that we take completely for granted because we're like oh they're here and oh i squashed one whatever you know they're worthless but when you look down at what they do fundamentally and how integral it is into the entire system of oops, production. That's usually me who does that. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> she conveniently the hits the mic every time <laughs> I'm talking. It's true. <laughs> As a bleep. Convenient. Yeah. <laughs> but it is sort of crazy how the bees do everything and anything. And then the other crazy thing, and I'm sure there will be some, a little bit of lashback on this, is the honeybees from Europe aren't the best at doing that. Really? Our native ones are the best at doing that. Our carpenter bees and our native mason bees and all the other bees that we have natively, they're so efficient at pollinating, especially native flowers like the what is apples. A, and the, what, is, what do the native bees look like? They're much smaller, and they're usually... Um, the honeybee is like very distinct. It's different yeah, honeybees are pretty darn big. They're big, and they're kind of cute and have fuzzy little butts. And they always, yeah, and they always have the... Um, <laughs> pollen sacks on their legs which it's interesting because yeah. when they're ga- gathering different types of pollen it changes color and we've seen everything from oh. neon yellow green black red yellow all shades of yellow and green which is really cool wow but that the, is interesting it's really the native bees that do the most efficient pollination of all of especially the native stuff and a lot of our fruit crops as well and the bumblebees do the bigger stuff like the tomatoes and um, squash mm. and Sometimes even the beans need a little just encouragement to shed their pollen on themselves because beans self, so you don't need a pollinator, but you need them to shake their pollen onto themselves within. And so the bumblebees come in and looking for it, just doing their buzzing. Same with tomatoes, too. One of the artificial ways to pollinate tomatoes is you take a vibrating wand and touch all the flowers, and all it does is make the pollen fall because it's an enclosed flower. Okay. And it 
pollinates itself, but the bumblebee is just coming and taking the nectar from it is what pollinates it because as their wings vibrate and they just match the vibration of the wings of the bumblebee on the hand pollinator, the vibrator that you use, and you just do it just enough and for like a split second, it makes all the pollen shake off and fall onto the pistils inside. That is and, interesting. so interesting. Yeah, and so that's how they artificially pollinate happening. tomatoes. But the bumblebees will do it naturally, and that's why we haven't had any problems with tomato fruit set in our backfield, because we have a have bumblebee bees, yeah. swarm out there, because we just allow the rye and vetch to flower and bloom, because they collect the pollen from the, the rye and the nectar from the vetch, and we've had, like, Star Wars battles of all the insects flying around out in the backfield. It's amazing. This wow. is, so, I mean... Speaking of insects, I feel like they play, all of them, even the annoying ones, they play like an important role in, in the, the circle of life, which is another Lion King reference um, <laughs> that huh. she doesn't know. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's based off of reality that like everything kind of has its function in nature. And I don't know if you want to talk more about that, just how yeah, the, it certainly does. the bugs that we may think are pests actually serve a vital role. Yeah, even like the ants that we think are, you know, what could they possibly do? The two key roles that they actually play right now that I know of are on peony flowers. You love peonies. Everybody loves them. They're popular for weddings, I think. Yeah, and um, the ants actually come onto the the leaf sheath of the peony as it's coming out. It, it envelops itself in sort of a sheath, and then it expands out and pops. Mm -hmm. If the ants aren't there to chew away this sweet little layer that creeps creeps in along the edges of the, the leaves holding it in place, then it doesn't pop open. And so the ants are necessary for peony flowers to fully open, and I've seen it happen a couple times in areas where the peony flowers just sort of and then die instead of fully oh. opening and popping open. And then also mm -hmm. ants and some seeds use, um, I forgot the term of it, but there's a little oily glob on some seeds that entices ants to be like, hey, here's some food. And the ants take the entire seed, glob and all, into their burrow to store it for food. And that buries and plants the seed because they'll eat the little edible part off of the seed. I know bloodroot does this, one of the natives. And it has a little oily secret or blob of flesh on the outside that the ants love as food. And so they'll drag the whole seed into their nest and save it for eating later. I'm not sure if they ferment it or store it or dry it, but then as they chew it off, they eat only the part that isn't going to hurt the seed that the seed was offering as sort of the fruit of the seed. So this is why we shouldn't disrupt the pace of nature. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, there's unseen things that people don't, we don't even realize. We don't get the whole picture. Yeah, we, we can't mm -hmm. understand fully what's going on, so why destroy something that we don't understand the full effects of? And if we do, then we'll get the ramifications later and be like, oh my god, we shouldn't have done that, but it's too late. Exactly. And so what else do you grow there? Oh yeah, I tangented quite a bit. But well, we, yeah, we all did, we, but we tangent too. I also I, think it's important too, because that's... Yeah, it was a good... It's all well, re related to nature and, and the climate change that we uh, we're eventually going to yeah. get into. And, and health everything and is tang or not tangent. Well, maybe it lay. Yeah, tangents are just little strings of the spider web that pull everything together and hold it all in in coercion. Oh, okay. Well, what else do you grow there? We grow <laughs> yes, quite a bit of stuff. I try to experiment with a whole lot of different things, and I did um, thirty five different summer squash this year to trial them and about 37 or so winter squash and 60 beans. The beans didn't do well. We 60 different kinds of beans? Different types, yeah, between the bush wow. and the runner. I tried dual purpose that are both edible as snap and dry beans, and then, but the drought just killed them. Um, and then, oh, we do garlic. The onions did really well. Charlotte grows a whole bunch of different flowers for uh, cut flower His production. His fiance. Yes, my fiance, Charlotte. She also comes here, and we love her. <laughs> and she grows oh, probably like 30 or 40 different varieties of flowers excuse me that are just really diverse and we just discovered yesterday too through one of our friends we had come out and he was like oh my god you're growing uh, java ginseng and I'm like what that's jewels of opar and we looked it up and we're like oh my god you're right this is a dual purpose plant and I love dual purpose plants what does that mean um, that it has multiple uses and purposes and um, so the flowers is what Charlotte was cutting and using for bouquets the root is used as a ginseng adaptogen and so you can eat it and we did that we ate it right in the field and I'm like okay I'm trusting you but you know <laughs> nothing came of it and I'm sure I felt better from it too I just can't say that it was like 
it, it intoxicated me or anything, but and learning about all these different uses from the plants, and that's why we love diversity, because we'll always discover something new or just figure out, like this year in particular, what does well in a drought with minimal watering and being cut off from water at a certain point. And, and what, um, with the soulful blooms, mm -hmm. doesn't she have like a delivery service where she, you can yeah, sign up? Yeah, she's doing a flower CSA, and so it's, uh, CSA is Community Supported Agriculture, and you basically buy a subscription to getting a flower bouquet every week, and, uh, or every other week. Okay. And so then we'll deliver it, or you can pick it up on farm, or at, um, Prairie Crossing, which we have a, a couple people that live in Prairie Crossing, so the, uh, the Millers, who run... Uh, Prairie Wind Family Farm, we love them, let us use some of their space in their barn, their farm store. Where you can pick to, it up? Uh, yeah, do the pickup. And they also have a farm store they run year-round with whole lots of produce. And we had hands down the best spinach I've ever had in my life that set the new bar for it from them this spring. It was mm. like, we called it sugar leaf because it was, it was literally sweet. like sugar. You could have sweetened coffee with it. It was that sweet. Wow. I didn't know spinach ever. I don't be. I don't think I've ever Sweet. had fresh spinach. Tangent. You want to know why it does <laughs> yes. that? It's because um, spinach is one of those crops that you can um, cultivate in really cold climates pretty easily. And one of the reasons you can do that is it produces its own antifreeze. And guess what its own antifreeze is? It's sugar. It pulls sugar back out of solution from the starch stored in its roots, pumps it into its leaves, and just like road salt in the winter, it depresses the freezing temperature. So the leaves are allowed to survive and photosynthesize and be productive under much lower temperatures and that, when it's healthy it has a lot of sugar to spare is that like the same kind of sugar as like a sugar cane plant yes sugar is sort of ubiquitous there are a oh. whole bunch of different types of sugar they can be classified into their molecular structure but sugar is sort of sugar it's a simple carb carbohydrate that is broken down into its basic constituents and is used for the cellular energy and all sorts of stuff. I mean, microbes can break down really easily too, which is why mm. they put it into Petri dishes for their food source. Mm. Wow. Anything else? Beets? We tried the beets. They didn't do as great. Um, if we had gotten them planted with a little bit of water, they probably would have dove down to catch it earlier. But um, I'm not sure why our onions did very well this year because they tend to be more water demanding, but we had a lot of other stuff do really well, like the millet, the sorghum, some of the corn, a couple of the bean species that weren't the typical beans, they were offsets of different experimental type beans and they had no problem with the drought. The cow peas did really well. Um, lots of perennials, the rhubarb, asparagus, something called skirret, which I'll just gloss over if people want to look it up. <laughs> it's really obscure. Do you and, guys make uh, a rhubarb pie with your rhubarb? Oh yeah, every time we can. And then um, <laughs> uh, cobblers. We love cobblers oh, too. Nice. Because then you can just sort of mix the batter in and let the fruit like mingle with cobbler? it. Like a peach cobbler? Oh, from yeah, rhubarb. from rhubarb, makes, strawberries, okay. yeah. berries, Same. blueberries, yeah. Do you have fruit trees? <laughs> um, we had a whole bunch of peach trees. The polar vortices destroyed them and they also got really bad peach leaf curl, which oh. then basically made them stunted enough that they didn't produce well. We got about four peaches out of the seven trees that we had for five years. Oh. And so it was an utter disappointment. I, mean, I, I kind of knew that going into it. There are a few things we've tried out there that just will never grow. Blueberries is one of them because we live on basically a fen, which is a unique biological habitat or ecosystem where the groundwater comes up through limestone bedrock and makes it alkaline, and blueberries need acid in the soil. And so we've always had a really bad problem with those. and. It's been sort of interesting dealing with that because in several areas I've done soil tests, it'll come back being wildly, vastly different than a hundred feet over the other way. And it's just like, wow, how can it be that different in such a small area? Uh, because of the limestone or in that, for yeah. example. And just yeah, the, yeah. yeah, as for an example, the limestone pushes up through the, the groundwater. And, and we have clients that get eggs from you guys. Yeah, we you also have chickens. Have chickens and the my brother takes care of the chickens now and honeybees. We've had to excessively protect them from predators where we built what we call the Fort Knox of uh, the the chicken enclosure where we have dog uh, panel or dog kennel panels and uh, it's then, probably a lot of coyotes and stuff up there, right? Oh yeah, Foxes we have too, the, the, the red-tailed hawks, the great oh, horned owls yeah. that live on the property. We've seen eels but not around. The eels won't attack chickens either and mm. the raccoons, the possums, the skunks even sometimes. Uh, we had a mink or weasel kill some of our baby chicks once too. Mm. And uh, yeah, mm. it's just endless, the, plus the coyotes, and the coyotes are the really the ones that the 
enclosure really helps against because even before we had a raccoon find its way in through one little hole that <sighs> had happened because a tree swelled enough to snap some wires and side note how, what is the right way to say coyote is it coyote or is it coyote what do you I've say? always said coyote. I said coyote because Maybe of it's wily like a coyote. Thing? Oh, I but think coyotes, that's what taught it to me. Coyote, oh. the plural is I've heard coyotes. coyotes. I've heard coyote and coyotes. Have you heard coyotes? Coyotes. I've heard yeah. coyotes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's both. <laughs> I was yeah, just noticing because you said coyote because I was like, potato, oh. potato. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll say one way or another. I like tomato, to tomato, tomato. You like diversity. Yeah. I like diversity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the reasons that we bonded, um, Jeff and I, is over this topic of mental health. Um, you were going through uh, a depression when I first met, when, I, when we first started talking a few months ago, um, but you also shared with me that um, mm -hmm. the way that you've seen things change over the, even the last few years in terms of the soil and the climate and the weather and all that, is really starting to uh, create a, a constant anxiety in you, and then that can lead to a depression. Yeah. You want to explain a little bit more about that feeling of being out of control and in, with what's happening with the with the planet and with your farm yeah. too. I have recognized recently that a lot of my anxiety stems from lack of control, which I found really interesting to myself and just to sort of realize and reflect on. But I do feel like a lot of the control is sort of out of my hands, even though I'm trying to do as much as I can and doing outreach too to help educate people of the value of nature and how to respect it properly. But um, it's tough when I, I live in a spot like that where we do have a lot of neighbors too that champion conservation and they really try to exemplify and um, do their own methods of conservation on their property too. But then I'm surrounded on three sides by industrial farming which still uses the extreme tillage, the spraying of poisons, and the use of genetically modified crops to push something out of the land that may not necessarily be a, a good use of it, in my opinion, too, especially in the area we are, where it's so unique and pristine and it's been protected so well that why should we try to, why should we not try to protect it from constant bombarding every year? Because the main message that I've found is that nature has an incredible capacity to heal but only when it's allowed the time to heal if you constantly attack something and i thought of this analogy earlier that i liked a lot is you can handle a paper cut it's no big deal you get a paper cut and you're like oops oh well that'll be, better be all right i'll just avoid getting another one right there for another while but if you get another one right there like 10 minutes later you're like ooh, or biting your mouth that's another good example yeah oh yeah, yeah. the biting in the mouth probably resounds more with people because you're like yeah i can bite my mouth Everyone once and be like that. Yeah. Mm, that hurt but it'll <laughs> yeah. heal and the mouth heals really fast too so that's maybe a better example okay well doesn't saliva help heal it I know does. with like the dogs. Terrain theory. Yeah. Dogs and plus specifically, enzymes. but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms inside of our body to allow us to heal that we don't even really understand yet fully. And nature is the same way, too, where we have all these mechanisms for healing and recovery, which um, one of the main ways is diversity. Like if there's a diverse uh, ecosystem and you come in and disturb it, then there's going to be a good amount of seeds and organisms and other things to seed what's going to be the recovering phase but if you continuously attack it and try to sterilize it then nothing's going to be there to recover and so the first things that are, that are going to encroach upon that disturbed area are going to be the nuisance stuff like the what we consider weeds or um, noxious weeds too in the u.s or there's a whole categor categorization of weeds where if they're noxious they can be the either toxic extremely det detrimental to the environment or extremely challenging to agricultural situations. Wow. And so if it's if it's so, continuously degraded, <laughs> just yeah, it just has no wow. chance to recover. But getting back to the I'm mouth thing, to process yeah, you say. Katie and I are <laughs> Sorry, like, yeah, when, when we first, remember when we're we first of, talked, we are like, yeah. Yeah, what yeah, you said. Yeah, that. What you said. <laughs> <laughs> but um, getting back to the mouth, you were comparing nature to like, if you have, if you bite your lip once, Constantly, no big deal. Yeah. But if you, if you do it over and over same without with allowing a recovery period, it's going to okay. be decreased so at first in its, its ability not, to recover. People are like, oh, that infection. Okay, so like in nature, people are like, well, that didn't do anything by throwing that trash there. Mm -hmm. It's just one cigarette it's that I threw one, out the window. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's the it's accumulation, like the, it's the cumulative that, effect. effect of it. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
Mm-hmm. And so what specifically have you noticed has changed? Do you, ha- do you have, um, um, well, you ability, definitely have weather, and yeah. then we had a drought, right? Yeah, the ability of the soil to buffer has been diminished, and that's really one of the scariest things is that the soil has a crazy, amazing, mysterious capacity to support things that we didn't think it really could, especially in this region where we have such a rich soil and diversity where you can grow almost anything, especially if the soil is nice. But if you don't disallow all of the processes that keep it nice, which is basically having living things interact with it, which has Mm. been sort of my uh, revelation is that the best thing you can do is keep it constantly active because then the what I call the biological sponge absorbs stuff and releases it properly. And so there's going to be like the earthworms and all the other microbes, which it compounds a whole universe of existence. And then the plant roots themselves and other insects that burrow into it. And even the bigger ones like chipmunks, mice and voles and rodents, um, then they're going to have an overall positive effect on the environment because they're holding in place inside of them and through their own interactions, a lot of the necessary nutrients, constituents, and also purifying actions that are necessary to keep that environment healthy. Like the earthworms cultivate inside, well they don't cultivate, but they'll eat stuff that has a lot of bacteria on it. And they're not actually eating the um, the pieces of leaf or anything. They're actually stripping the bacteria off and getting the nutrients from the bacteria that are attacking and de- decomposing stuff, which I always thought was fascinating. They're mm-hmm. not actually eating what we would consider food, they're yeah. absorbing their nutrients from the microbes that have then ate, eaten their food. And so that, that always reminded me of ferments and why they've been around for so long and how they actually increase nutrient availability, which is What's sort of ferment? crazy. Fermented products and foods like kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, which are, we have oh, some Oh, fermented of products. Okay, I thought there was like a like a creature named a ferment. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, the firmament. <laughs> like a rodent. <laughs> the ferment. <laughs> my pet ferment but yeah that's the that's the universe of microbes is the fermentation because they have all their own specialized little things and it happens inside of us too which we're starting to realize a lot more is that we're we're not just one organism where we can cut ourselves off from the rest of it and exist just fine that there's lots of little cofactors that go into our health that we really have no understanding of right now and this is a, a great message and nature is a good analogy to humans like we all play a role and mm-hmm. we all are important and we may not understand the big picture but we all have a message to it share. is a lot like society mm-hmm. yeah where yeah. there's specialized ones that will do certain tasks and some of those certain tasks are absolutely critical and if you exterminate or extinguish one of those abilities to pr- produce those or to perform those tasks then you're at a huge loss. And you, sometimes mm-hmm. you don't even see what those losses are going to be till later. Yes. Once you know? you've extinguished it or exterminated like said, it, you can't go back late. in nature yeah. because an, an extinction event is permanent and it's sort of scary. Um, well, <laughs> I saw yeah. a news article recently <laughs> that, and this is, this is a tangent, but I saw a news article recently that they're trying to bring back woolly mammoths, which oh, is I'm know. like... Haven't we seen Jurassic Park? I feel like this yeah. is like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jurassic Park no. is really spot set of movies. <laughs> we haven't seen Jurassic Park. Mary has not seen <laughs> okay. Jurassic Next. Park. Next Nature pop comes concert. away. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah, it just shows why oh. that's not a good idea. You know? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> nature, back, like, nature has its things. own path. And we may not know what that path is or that purpose. And right. we try and force it in one way. Sometimes it straight out revolts. And it's like, no, this is the path. There's no changing the path. Right. So is that going to happen? I don't know. It was that's the article, scary. take everything online with a grain of salt kind of thing. But that's what I Do you think I, that I could heard. happen? I think it's uh, there's a potential, especially if we perpetuate it to the, the levels of extinction event that we've never experienced in a natural set, or even experienced in natural settings in the historical record that we can deduce from. that it, The extinction events happened, and it took a really long time for things to stabilize, and they never fully returned to the diversity and lushness that they really had been in previous times which is why I always comes back to like diversity is strength to me if we especially in society too like if we See, have diversity I love this analogy yeah then you can mm-hmm. you can make sure that everything gets done and even if you think it's not important maybe it's really important like the 
50 years ago. We didn't think psychology or social work or anything like that was Mental important. Mental health, True. here's our podcast, and now, right. Yeah, we're starting to realize how it incredibly matters. important yeah. it can be, especially to stay healthy. When you take it for granted that you're going to be okay or that it always tends to stay healthy, and then all of a sudden it isn't, uh, how do you fix it if you don't understand the system and how it came to be disrupted? So also being open to learning and growing and changing and admitting you were wrong, right? Yeah. Saying, oh, I, th I was over here, but I'm going to actually say I was mistaken. And being a farmer, that has yeah. happened so many different times to me where I'm like, I'm going to do it this way because I've heard it and seen it and it looks great and it's going to work so well. And then I realize like, well, maybe there's a better way. And I do try it a different way. And I'm like, yeah, there's, you know, it's not day and night. It's not like this is the way to do it or this is the best. But it's been really fascinating to me to understand that there's so many different ways to get from point A to point B. And that if you can do it in an elegant and non-damaging way, that a way that's meant to encourage life in general and uh, encompass an overall improvement in your entire surroundings and ecosystem, which is the method that I believe nature uses for the most part, then you're, you're overall going to be improving everything, yourself, and your surroundings at the same time. And understanding why, which if, if you can understand why, and I feel like if people could understand why, there wouldn't be any debate on whether or not we should try and encourage people to be more in touch with it and appreciate it more and interact and experiment a little bit more with nature because nature is just a phenomenal teacher and I've latched on to it and I've never had regrets. See, there you go. You're not you're not burnt out from it after 11 no, years. You've no. gotten you have so much more to learn. And, and even with so the drought exciting. this year, I'm not mad at nature. I'm just frustrated with farming and the, the methods we've used, which is why I'm sort of being like, well, maybe we should try and think of a different way to approach the way we utilize the property because I did recognize that we did a bunch of tillage for our annual crops this year and the um, disturbance of the soil has a big effect and then especially during a drought and it dries out too much and kills a lot of the stuff that's right on the surface and that's where most of the action happens and it was just sort of difficult to watch that happen and understand that I made the damage happen, and, and so I'm starting so then, to yeah, then, yeah that's reconcle even, and be like, well, how can I make it But at it least not you be... were willing to change and not continue to do yeah, it. Yeah, and we have to sort of adapt and figure out. And that's one of the other things with the conservation easement, too, on the property. We can't change where the paths are. We can't lay down a boardwalk on top of a path because it's muddy during a certain time. And so I figured out... Well, our path gets our paths always get really muddy when not this year, but going <laughs> up to the back field because it gets when it rains it doesn't dry out for a while and if it rains a lot it runs off onto the paths because they're sort of a low part now. Uh -huh. And um it took a long time but I finally figured out a, a way to flow around it like a river and I'm like, "Oh, well, I figured out that basically the main reasons the paths are not being as resilient as they used to be, which I remembered as a kid, is that the trees are getting bigger and create casting more shade. And so I identified several of the species of trees that were out there that were no longer really welcome um, on the conservation easement. And I got written permission from them to uh, eradicate the Norway maples and cut down a lot of the black walnuts too, which both those trees actually have what's called um, allelopathic, I believe, effects where they exude chemicals from them that deter a lot of other different types of plants from growing in some organisms too. And so they decrease the bioavailability or biodiversity and the availability of habitat for different uh, native organisms underneath the trees. And uh, it sort of goes against exactly what I'm trying to I be know, but... and do is be like, I want diversity. I want it to be like a hundred different species under here instead of three. And um, so I, was, I got the permission through sort of talking with their ecologists and making my own arguments like, yeah, it's allelopathic. I've noticed all these things. I've done these studies and research. And can I now have written permission to eradicate the Norway maples and cut out certain black walnuts? Because we have a black walnut grove that they're getting huge and they're meant uh -huh. for lumber. And so they could be really valuable in the future. They're almost too big to hug. And uh, the real straight ones can be used for veneer logs, which you can sell for a lot of money. That was my grandpa's plan, too, was to Aww. create a college fund grove, which and, and took and a lot longer than getting... you guys college? Yeah, <laughs> and it could probably put one person through college now. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's impressive these days. You know, yeah. you don't even think of all of this. Um, so um, I want to just back up a little bit to... Is that okay? Or do you have... 
It's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to talk more about Jurassic Park? <laughs> Push forward. Nature. Nature. Can talk about Jurassic Park if you want. I, um, obviously you had a predisposition for depressive episodes because you said you had to withdraw from the University of Illinois because mm-hmm. of a depressive episode. Yeah. What happens to you? Like then and now when you have a depressive episode? Oh, it's the most frustrating thing because my mind is one that really needs to understand what's going on. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things that actually adds to the momentum of my depression is it seems to come out of nowhere. And I still haven't been able to fully identify really at all what triggers it. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just frustrating is the the one main word that always seems to pop back up when I try to address it but, but what been, do, what happens you, you lay in bed I've heard yeah I I think that's part of my defensive mechanisms too is I've made sure because I've been dealing with it since I was about 16 or 17 for the most part and I probably had bouts of it before then but it wasn't diagnosed and didn't get recognized mm-hmm. for what it was yeah and I usually get very quiet I just withdraw and I've understood, too, that in the past I've used anger as a response, and that was a, a no-go, and I had to go to anger therapy for it and all okay. sorts of stuff, and which I think helped, but it also created these sub-habits of me creating a protective environment for myself by shutting off and shutting down okay. and uh, cutting off people from, like... Uh, around me and to an extent that's really helpful because sometimes I do lash out and I'm very hurtful and harmful and I can create a lot of damage when I'm in that situation and so I tend to self-subdue and isolate a little bit to try and avoid that but at the same time the isolation can also feed back into it and make me feel like I am alone and abandoned and nobody wants to interact with me or try and help me does it help you process a little bit like when you're sitting with your own thoughts or that's the double-edged sword right there is that sometimes I can be like oh well I'm being mindful about it I'm trying to reflect like what was it was it something that triggered me like did I have an argument? Did I have a bad thought get into my head that I allowed to latch on with fish hooks and just pull me down? Mm-hmm. But most of the time, it really just it frustrates me because I'll re- reflect on that and not be able to pull anything out of it or learn anything or mm-hmm. create any um, any amount of being able to prevent it in the future, any knowledge of what may have instigated it and it just really gets to me sometimes which can then drag me down further so I do feel like sometimes I will just shut off and my my, actually my my personal thing to do is to try and take a nap because I realize that that sometimes resets Mm -hmm. some of the um the very strong thoughts that I have circulating and sort of spiraling I call it inside of my head because the negative ones they'll they'll sort of spiral in a circle instead of just acting like an explosive firework and exploding and being done yeah, they don't get out. Yeah, they, they won't exit. They're, they swim around like a, a minnow in a school of fish, and you can't pick out the right one to analyze it. How long do these um, depressive episodes kind of last for you? Like, is there an average, or are they kind of all over the spectrum? It's pretty average to being, which is what I, uh, man, I have so many different theories about it, too, that <laughs> I try and explore into, and I'm starting to feel like a lot of it could be from a type of inflammatory response to my central nervous system somehow. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm looking at elimination diets to try and figure that out, but it's easier said than done to eliminate wheat and soy and milk for me, too, because I'm a cheese boy. I grew up from with all boy. the Wisconsin <laughs> cheese being imported down here, and the, some of the best. That. Oh, man, it's so good still. But how long, how long, Jeff, do they last on average? It's about two to three days. It's uh-huh. usually the shortest has been a day where I'm like, that didn't seem like depression. It felt like it, but it happened so quickly. But then in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, it was. It just it cleared faster, and I don't know why. Yeah. But it's usually about two or three days. And in fact, about two days ago, I had one happen, and I was kind of worried yesterday. I'm like, oh my god, maybe I won't be up to coming on the podcast because when I get depressed, it truly depresses my central nervous system. I can't. You I can't couldn't talk think. like this. Yeah. I couldn't flow my speech. I couldn't be comprehensive or even understandable I would be jumping around tangentially even more so (laughs) and And it would be very difficult to and I do shut down a lot even without realizing it I it's sort of like my my go-to is to be like oh I'm I'm feeling real bad let's withdraw so we don't attack attack yes exactly so how do you eventually pull out I think it just happens naturally is uh 
it sort of slowly heals. And before, when I was in my 20s and early 30s, it would happen and then I would have a rebound. And it would almost seem bipolar because I'd get this really nasty, like day two, sometimes three. And then the next two or three days after that, I'd be like, bam, right back in it. I feel like a million bucks and I can think so much more clearly even before this even happened. It's it's almost like a high. Yeah. And so I had wondered for a long time, but never diagnosed with bipolar, bipolar and all the medications I tried for it really interacted poorly with me. I tried like a dozen different depression medications and okay. lithium was my least favorite of all because it made me feel like nothing inside and that was scarier Ooh. than feeling bad. Yeah, no, I... I understand that. I mean, when I would get really depressed, and I, there's been a couple times where it's gotten really bad, the the worst part of it was not feeling sad. It was just like the emptiness. I think we lost our camera over there. Uh-oh, I'm off camera now. I can do anything. Yeah, you can do whatever. You still got <laughs> your you profile that on one. that one. Profile. Oh, yeah. Don't forget okay. profile. Just gesticulate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it lasted. It was. It's always been very strange, and the most perplexing and frustrating thing to me is that I can't find the patterns and I think a big part of it is that when I go dive into a depression I'm not in a good mind state or mental state to really analyze things nicely or cohesively or uh, properly and does I guess. anxiety go along with this or are those separate episodes I've been trying to figure this out. I know that anxiety can absolutely trigger it, especially recently with uh, a whole bunch of the negative thought cycles that I've been catching myself up in. It has definitely been it in, if not the cause, then a very big contributor to it. And okay. I think a lot of that stems from the, the inability to control. And that's what I, like, as I'm saying, like, I don't understand why it happens. That frustrates me and makes it even worse. And yeah, it's it's a control thing. Like, I need to know deep down it's just a very strong desire to be able to know how and why so that I can manipulate it myself which if I put it in those terms it's very selfish of me to want to understand something so deeply enough to be able to manipulate it but is that the scientist me. in you yeah yeah you that's think? the scientist in me wanting to be like come on there's a way there's okay. a, science has an explanation for everything man got it but it doesn't. It doesn't. Because we have our limits of cognizance as well and our abilities to think on multiple topics. And mm. and like you said, nature has a path. Yeah. So sometimes you try to manipulate nature, but it's like, mm -hmm. nope, sorry, this is the path. Yeah, exactly. And the same with your brain. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, and I like Einstein's quote, too, of where you can't... Un you, ah, I'll always mess this up, too, which I should memorize it, but I have a problem. You can't over-understand a system. Or a system can't overcomprehend itself. That's what it was. A so system. the human brain can't understand the human brain, just as the universe can't understand the universe. It's bigger than itself, and it's bigger than its own abilities to comprehend. The human brain is so incredibly advanced. Like uh, we can't even, we don't even yeah. know any of all this stuff that's happening in there. We you know? wouldn't be able to comprehend a human brain using a human brain. <laughs> No. True. And that, that's, I think, the essence of the quote from Einstein is like, you can't understand something using the basic, basic systems of understanding the system itself. So maybe just accepting well, you can't understand it is okay, though? I've tried accepting that a few times, and then my innate like subconscious is like, I won't accept that. <laughs> I, I need an explanation, because there's always a greater understanding that you can achieve. And I, I, I feel like that's true, that you, if through patience and perseverance and attention, you can, I don't want to say dominate, that's the wrong <laughs> word, but you can understand, um, you can gain a lot more control over knowledge and be able to put things together in a different way, too. And a lot of the time I realize, too, it's, it's my stupid monkey brain, I just need to appease it. And so I do come up with these solutions that I know aren't fully full explanations, but it helps to just have a, a parcel or a fragment to be able to put into the, the puzzle. So if you're doing a puzzle and you, you don't have any pieces, if you find a piece, you're like, oh, I found one. At least I know it's it's got red in it. So it's a progression then. It is, It's yeah. not all or nothing like you said with nature. It's like, okay, we can improve this and try this and maybe learn a little more. And mm -hmm. you're learning about yourself and you're learning what you need. Maybe you don't understand the human brain, but you're trying to understand yours. Yeah, and I've, I've understood, too, that one of the best things that has ever helped me point. was introducing myself into nature. <laughs> 
but yeah, getting getting myself into nature has been an incredibly healing facet to um, just okay. being able we to. We should wrap up soon. Okay. Yeah, just was we we lost our other camera now. <laughs> okay. What? Yeah. Why? Okay, do we need to talk about that, right? Because well, it's, it's fine. We'll let's just finish. finish. Yeah, because then we just got one more camera left. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can hey. always. We can always do another uh, another episode if yeah. we need to finish. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, we could. Yeah, do a continuation. We yeah, you no, know what? We could, we'd love to have Part you back two. on. We might we might have to do that sure. soon. We might want to, as a matter of fact. Yeah, because I have a lot more questions now, and yeah. that could be no, our this is really interesting that could be stuff. our filler, Katie. We can talk about it. And yeah. maybe <laughs> nature has a path, and the and the camera said. My natural path is I'm tired. You're going to have your good idea the next session. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if I could, I'd like to talk about, too, the uh, the convergence of the ecosystems here in Wyoming Lake County yeah, itself. Yeah, that's is a so big one. so specifically very important. And, and I unique. love that because so many people are like, I hate Illinois. I hate, you know, the Midwest. I hate, hate, hate. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to ecosystems, we're in pretty good shape, it's right? It's pretty fascinating because we have a whole bunch of different ones converge onto one spot and we have the uh, forests of wisconsin coming in to meet the the western plains and then eastern th- there's actually dunes on the ba- ba- the underside of chicago and lake michigan and i had my little blurb and now i'm not remembering all of it but there's like seven different ecotypes that are very unique especially along uh the displains river the uh calcitic limestone bed um prairies where there are fens and other uh, alkaline prairies, which are very unique. That not many prairies exist in an alkaline state. They're usually acidic. Well, and you can even read that little blurb if you want, um, and then okay. we're going to link it as well because it's a, a book about... It is. It's um, one of my favorite books, and I learned about it through Ken Click, the ecologist at uh, the Lake County Forest Preserve System, who came out and viewed our orchid and spurred a very... Uh, contagious excitement in me when I showed him I was like yeah here's our wild orchid our native orchid and he's like oh my god oh my god oh my god it is it's a it's a white lady slipper orchid because that's one of the more rare ones that just really isn't seen anywhere anymore and he got so excited I'm like yeah that's exciting oh my god yeah Mm -hmm. let's get excited about this reminds me of the big bang theory where they're all talking about all these things you know scientific that nobody really understands Mm -hmm. and then somebody (laughs) peeks in and they're like oh yeah you you want to pay attention to that it (laughs) did get me very excited too because (laughs) we had the um the the white the showy or white I forgot now. The white lady slipper orchid that um, must have spread itself by their uh, their dust seeds. They produce a seed pod that takes about seven or six or seven months to, I don't know, I guess it's four months here, to mature. The tropical one's about nine months. And they put all their eggs in one basket by producing a million or so seeds in each seed pod that are like dust. And then they blow around on the wind. They're single cell. They don't have any, any endosperm to sprout with. And then when they land... This is amazing, too. I'll tell this story every time, anytime. Uh The orchids need a specific type of fungus to try and eat them. And as it tries to eat them, it then biochemically and genetically turns the tables and says, nope, you're going to feed me. And so it uses the fungus as the food source to initiate its germination and beginning of life. And then it turns the tables later on in its life and habitates with the fungus creating a home and giving it energy in the form of sugar for it and then it exchanges nutrients from the soil and uh, it's like the harry potter thing where it became a complete change in the person that loved harry potter's mother like all the while you thought he was a bad guy and then it ended up changing oh, into yeah. a good guy it switches over it's did good. i make okay, a good I was like where is she going because <laughs> yeah yeah the orchid seed trying to say po- talk about harry potter is yep. funny. Pop, no I pop culture reference so yeah <laughs> so why don't you read your quote and sure, then maybe yeah. we could do it uh, we could do a continuation um, yeah let's cause, like because we we have to see what's going on and stuff, it's so. not supposed to happen that way right hey i told you yeah. early on I'm the techno. That's right. Baffler. You are the one. You're the it, you're the problem. It confounds it. Yeah. <laughs> you did you did mention that before we started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so this is from, I don't remember. There's two authors to it. It's Swink, the uh, Plants of the Chicago Region, and this is sort of the gospel of the conservationists and naturalists and stuff because they put this book together I think in the 80s and it's just been, uh, it has never been outdone. 
it's so comprehensive nice. and extensive and and it's a book yeah and so this little blurb that they wrote it it's summed it up really well the chicago region is situated so that it contains an amazingly unique combination of landforms and floristic communities our born <clears throat> our boundaries encompass nearly all the re remarkably complex and interesting valparaiso moraine system which skirts the southern end of lake michigan this region also includes the deciduous forests of the east Oops, sorry, I skipped a line. The, lake, the plain districts of Glacial Lake Chicago is associated swell and swale and dune systems. The deciduous forests of the east meet the western prairies and savannas, northern bogs and swamp forests, plains, river, and virtually all of the Kankakee River bottomlands are within the Chicagoland boundaries, as are the magnificent bluff forests and fen systems of the Fox River and its headwaters. It would be difficult to... Con circumscribe another area of the north temperate zone with such geologic and physiographic diversity our native flora consisting of 1638 taxa reflects this which is a lot that means that we have probably two or three times as much as basically any other region because it goes into pure regions beyond us where instead this region is where it all converges nice. it's like the rainforest meets the ocean meets the desert sort of like in is Africa. Is that why we don't have as many extremes as the coasts in terms Probably. of the weather? You know, fires, floods, you know, yeah. hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot um, of that has to do with, um, because I think a lot of the, the forest that grows in Wisconsin doesn't get the as bushy of growth, and we don't dry it. We don't have a dry season, except for this year, <laughs> like they do out west. And so the out west, the, fire, the fires are usually caused by a dry season plus winds plus an ignition source. I, w I was thinking, like, when you were talking about that, I'm wondering if that's why people decided to settle, like, in Chicago and create it into a city, because it oh, had such absolutely. a rich ecosystem. Yeah. Back, I'm assuming back then, like, you know, I don't know how long Chicago's been around, a couple hundred years <laughs> or something? Four I've, or five years, I think. They might have. <laughs> I know they like the river. Yeah, four yeah, or five years. The river for, <laughs> and uh, the Displains and the Chicago River, which did, didn't actually connect to Lake Michigan, but now it does, I think. Yeah. I might be mistaken, but they, they did locks. Actually, my grandpa was part of the lock building system, too. Oh, so oh, that was interesting I love to learn this about. Man. Grandpa. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, there was um, commerce from the rivers, which were the original highways. And I learned recently, too, that uh, Milwaukee Avenue, before it was turned into a stagecoach avenue, was actually a Native American trail called Milwaukee Trace. And so the restaurant in the downtown restaurant, Libertyville, that's why it's, called it's that? spelled that way, too, because that's how they used to spell it. The it was, K Y at the end yeah. instead of K E. Yeah, Milwaukee, like walking. Whoa. And um, I think the Milwaukee did come from Native American naming. A and, lot of Wisconsin names got yeah. were Native American. And right? you can tell that too, like Waukesha and They're all Kenosha sounds. and yeah. Oconomowoc. Yeah, I love that one. <laughs> That's a good one. And then uh, lots of O's. Yeah, the Kankakee. I love it. It's too. so funny to hear British people say it. Oh yeah, yeah. Oconomowoc. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've said it wrong too until the, the people that live there are like, oh, it's pronounced this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I just, oh. I grew up kind of close to it. So I, yeah, that's probably mm -hmm. why I know. But yeah. Okanamawaka. Okanamawaka. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we wrap it up for today? And I think we need to have just a part two. And, and yeah, we'll yeah, have yeah, you we back on. We could go into the part two and explain a little bit more about what I'm doing and growing up. Yeah, exactly. I want I want to uh, delve into. Um, where you're, where you're heading with you know wanting to try to get some control back in order to yeah. help your mental health and help the community help society help mm -hmm. the planet and I'm sure there'll be much more discussion than just that small thing oh yeah, that's yeah, part yeah, of the fun yeah we can make discussion having an open discussion <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right. Well, for now, just in case we lose our third camera, <laughs> which we have no idea, it could be it off. It could be We're off. Already, yeah. um, but in case <laughs> it's not, <laughs> we are going to say thank you for listening and. Next, uh, the next week will be Jeff again because we need the filler. So he's our filler. Huh. Cool. That works. <laughs> Isn't that so nice to be called I a filler? I, I can be a filler. <laughs> Fillers are be some of the best parts of the bouquet. Okay, see? We're back to nature. Little baby's breath. Mm -hmm. something, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> the intricate ones that you don't think serve a purpose, but they really do. They do. Yeah, it's the accents, the little pop. Yeah, because without them, it feels empty. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, thanks, thanks for, for, for coming on. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.